In the context of the church today, what comes to your mind when you hear the word worship? Go ahead and take a moment and just think on that for a second. For a good majority of people in church today, I'd be willing to bet that the answer, or at least part of your answer, probably has something to do with music. Singing songs about God, who He is, and why He's deserving of our praise and honor, and so on. Maybe you're one of the people who loves this. Maybe you even started thinking about your favorite worship song or your kind of worship music, whether that's more contemporary or maybe a good old hymn. Or maybe you're in the other camp, and instead you thought about how it's your least favorite part of church and how you don't understand why a group of people gets up there each week and makes you sing at all. Because you get more out of the sermon anyways, and so you just shoot to be at church at about 11.15 so you can miss out on worship entirely. Regardless of which camp you land in here, I'm here to share a bit about why God not only wants to hear you sing to Him, literally, but to show that He actually commands it of us. But I also want to say that worship goes far beyond music as well. Worship isn't just about singing and music at all, but music is just a very powerful expression of worship that is mentioned numerous times throughout Scripture in both the New and Old Testament. I also want to share how making a regular practice of worship in our lives, both musically and non-musically, are absolutely vital parts of growing closer in our relationship with Christ. Throughout this series, we'll be looking at many different spiritual practices. The practice of spending time in prayer, of being a witness, being in community, slowing down, practicing solitude, being generous, fasting, keeping the Sabbath, and also the practice of serving. What if I told you that each of these practices can actually all be different forms of worship, just like singing and dancing can be a form of worship? If this doesn't seem right to you, I'd like to first dive into why I believe this to be true biblically, and then I'll also circle back a bit to focus more on the importance of the musical side of worship this week, since in the other weeks we'll be covering those other topics more in depth. I just want to make the case that all of these things should be part of our practice of worship, and that over time these elements can start to look less like a bunch of separate things we need to do to be super self-disciplined about, and instead we can start to see that worship itself is actually a lifestyle we're called to as Christians. To begin with a biblical example, I actually want to take a look at the very first time that the word worship is mentioned in the Bible. An important side note here is that this isn't the first time that worship takes place in the Bible, but where the word worship itself first appears. We first see the word worship in Genesis chapter 22. Here we read about this heartwarming father and son hiking trip involving a man named Abraham and his only son Isaac. And the songs they sing together on the... Okay, so actually it's not quite that heartwarming and there's no songs that we know of. This is actually kind of a crazy place to jump in to have worship be the first word here. But it is what it is. So let's jump into it. To kick off the chapter, God tells Abraham in verse 2, Take Isaac, your only son, yes, Isaac, the one you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on the mountain, which I will show you. Oof. So yeah, there it is. Kind of a lot to unpack in this story that I won't unfortunately have time to get into today. But for those wanting more on this story, go ahead and ask Pastor Todd. I'm just kidding, kind of. But anyway, God tells Abraham to take something he loves more than anything on earth and to offer it up to him. But the obvious red flag for all of us here is that this isn't like giving up playing video games for a couple of weeks to focus on prayer instead. This is the killing of your son. It doesn't seem like something a loving God would even want Abraham to do. And you can sleep soundly knowing that you're right, and then God doesn't want that either. To summarize the story, God steps in and Abraham is told not to lay a finger on the boy and provides the sacrifice that God had in mind all along instead of Isaac in the form of a ram. He also gives Abraham a blessing for him and all of his descendants and all nations of earth. Whew, okay, good. Again, there's a lot to unpack there and what comes across is a pretty jarring story. But what is fascinating in the context of our focus today is that this is where the word worship first appears. Picking back up in verse four and five, we see this. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little further. We will worship there, and then we will come right back. I find it interesting that he uses the word we here. We will worship there. We. It isn't just Abraham that's going to worship on this mountain, and Abraham knew that. Abraham is being asked to willingly sacrifice that which he loves most, even when he can't fathom why God would ask it. And Isaac is being asked to trust God's provision and submit to God as well, even though he has not a clue what's going on. Isaac even asks his father along the way where the sheep is, and Abraham says that God will provide one, which is exactly what ends up happening. 
Now, this might have just been some wishful thinking, extreme wishful thinking on behalf of Abraham, but I think he really did believe and know in his heart that God is good and he didn't want to harm his son and that he would not let him perish on that mountain. I believe this is evidenced in him saying in verse 5, we will come right back, as well as in verse 8 when he says, God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son. Some may believe he was just lying, but I think the more I read it, that he really believed he was being tested and needed to do whatever God wanted of him in order to show he was willing to posture his heart towards God above anyone or anything else. Both of these guys were demonstrating in the absolute most extreme sense what worship really is. Worship is a heart posture, obedience to God, and the willingness to let go of things when they're coming before Him, submitting to His will above our own and praising Him for who He is and the things that He has done in our life, as well as trusting in His provision for our lives to come. This also matches up with Romans 12.1, where the definition of worship is given explicitly to us. I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that He has done for you. Let them be a holy and living sacrifice the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Okay, so now how do we get from there to music? Well, let's pivot and just think about it for a minute. Can you virtually go anywhere without hearing music? Not really. Go to a restaurant, a department store, a movie theater, or even just your car, and you'll likely find music there too. And why is that? Because music is an incredibly powerful tool that can transmit words in the form of lyrics and emotions in the form of melody and dynamics in a manner that is much more effective than the average speech. And it usually connects with us at a much deeper level. Don't believe me? Well, if not, can you tell me off the top of your head what Micah preached about a while back on December 10th, 2023? Even just the bullet points. What if I told you it was about joy? Probably not without looking it up. Also, it's a trick question anyway, because Donnie's the one that preached that week. But now how about this? Can you recite some of the lyrics to O Come All Ye Faithful, Just As Good, or What a Beautiful Name? And maybe the answer is still no, and that's okay too, but that one is far more likely, and I bet a number of you will be able to do just that. That's because music latches onto us in our brains and sticks with us far more effectively than being able to recall a whole teaching. We can learn things faster when we add in melodies, and those things usually stick with us for a lot longer too. It's just how we were designed. Now this isn't to say that teaching isn't important because it so is. It's just that music is also a powerful tool in our worship tool belt that we really can't look behind and minimize the importance of. And it's likely because of this that God commands us to worship Him in song. The first part of Colossians 3, Paul and Timothy give us some instruction on how to live our lives anew in Christ. In verse 16 they say, Let the message of Christ in all its richness fill your lives, teach and counsel each other with all wisdom He gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. You may have noticed here that they didn't say, if you want to, I guess you could maybe sing some songs. Instead, they actually give us three separate types of songs we should sing to God with thankful hearts. Now, I don't really believe that they're actually saying there's three separate song categories here, but rather they're emphasizing the importance of singing a variety of songs in multiple genres as a tool to let the message of Christ spread and to praise God and thank Him for who He is and what He has done. You might be thinking, okay, cool, but what if singing makes me feel uncomfortable and a bit self-conscious? Well, first off, let me say this. That's really fair, and I honestly can't relate to that at all. I've always really loved to sing, and I'm not too shabby at it either. But the good news is that whether you like to sing or not, it doesn't really matter, even if it makes you uncomfortable. It doesn't matter how we feel about it. Because, although it's for our benefit too, it's not about us at all. It's about proclaiming who God is and thanking Him. It isn't about if you're hitting the right notes. It's about where your heart's at when you sing those notes. And if you are someone who has a hard time wanting to sing or you feel weird or silly doing so, how much more pleasing must it be to the Father when you put that aside and you sing your little heart out in all its out-of-tune glory with all sincerity and give it everything you've got? We actually see the same concept play out with Jesus in Mark chapter 12. Picking up in verse 41, it says this, Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. Many rich people put in large amounts, and then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. Jesus called his disciples and said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. For they have given a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. This woman no doubt had the heart of a worshiper. Now if we take this same principle to what I mentioned before, what do you think pleases Jesus more? A professional musician singing a super technical song about him who's just going through the motions and not really thinking about what they're singing about at all? 
or the man who's putting his full heart before the Lord in submission and obedience, despite being told his entire life that he can't carry a tune in a bucket and that singing is for weak men, I can confidently say I don't think it's the first one. Psalm 33, one through three says, Rejoice in the Lord, righteous ones, for the praise of the upright is beautiful. Or as the message paraphrase puts it, good people cheer God. Right living people sound best when praising. And it goes on to say, use guitars to reinforce your hallelujahs. Play his praise on a grand piano. Compose him your own new song. Give to him a trumpet fanfare. I just love that. Worshiping via reading scripture and prayer and serving are all amazing forms of worship that we need. But come on, how cool is it that we have a God who can get down with the vast array of musical instruments supporting our collective voices singing out to Him? The scriptures talk about using our voices above all else, but also speaks a bunch on using loud crashing cymbals and drums, lyres, which are basically primitive guitars, trumpets, horns, harps, bells, and more. It even gives suggestions in the Psalms about what instruments the author had in mind to accompany that psalm which they wrote. This isn't just powerful to me, but it also sounds really fun. And it can to you too. I always find it kind of funny that someone might feel really pressured to be reserved and awkward in church when we sing together, but has no problem belting out Sweet Caroline at the top of their lungs at the Grizz game. And by all means, please keep doing that. Belt out Sweet Caroline. But also know that Jesus wants you to have just as much fun, passion, and energy in singing out about Him as you do in hands, touching hands, reaching out. Even though that energy and passion will obviously look a little bit different when He is the focus and you're trying to recenter your heart on Him. I really encourage you all to try this the next time you're singing in church. Let your guard down a bit and be willing to let the Holy Spirit work through you freely as we sing the songs that the worship team has prepared or that you pull up on Spotify. Don't just go through the motions, but really reflect on where your heart is and sing it like you mean it. Or let the music wash over you as you reflect on the words of the songs or reflect on the things God has done in your life that you have to be thankful for during the music. Maybe sit down and passively listen to it as you crack open the psalms and sing them quietly to the music instead. Just one way or another, use the gift of worshiping via music. Don't fight it and let God work in you as you praise Him in song. If you still aren't convinced it's for you and think it's just not, well, I'm sorry one last time, but it definitely is. We are called to be more like Christ, and along with modeling servant leadership like the world has never seen and modeling to us what love really means, Jesus also modeled singing songs with his disciples. If you didn't know, the book of Psalms is literally just a big collection of songs to be sung to God. It's also quite likely that Jesus sang these too when he attended the synagogue. And after breaking bread with his disciples during the Last Supper, we see in both Matthew 26 and Mark 14 that they all sang a hymn together before they went up to the Mount of Olives. I highly doubt that this was the only instance of them singing together too. It seems reasonable to assume singing together was a regular occurrence, or at least a somewhat regular occurrence for them, just as it was for many others in that time to do together. But either way, we see here that the Savior of the world himself sings songs of praise too. I also love that it doesn't say who had a great voice or a terrible one either. It doesn't really matter. The beauty on display here is that this group of people used singing to unify them more deeply together with Christ in a moment of praise and worship through song. Friends, there's so much more that I'd love to say and so much more that we could dive into here, but I know my time for this video is running out. I hope that paints a small but important picture of what worship looks like both in and outside of the context of music and what a lifestyle of worship might look like for you. I pray you continue to dive deeper on your own as well as with those around you into the scriptures as well as into the writings and teachings of other believers on the topic of worship. I also hope that this has been something that can encourage each of us to further deepen our relationship with Christ and therefore also radically transform our lives as we sing out his praises together as one collective voice in song.